This week we're covering Chapter 12, Social Psychology. How does group membership affect people? Over the course of human evolution, being kicked out of the group would have had dire consequences. People are motivated to maintain good relations with members of their groups. Group membership brings many challenges, such as figuring out how to be a good group member. The social brain hypothesis places such challenges in the context of brain size. According to this theory, primates have large brains, in particular large prefrontal cortices, because they live in dynamic and complex social groups that change over time. Most of the cerebral cortex consists of its outer layer, known as the neocortex. According to the social brain hypothesis, the size of a primate species' standard social group is related to the volume of the species' neocortex. Here, each open circle represents a species within the family monkeys, and each solid circle represents a species within the family great apes. In terms of neocortex size, Great apes may lie on a separate line from monkeys because they need more cognitive resources to support group living. Humans are at the pinnacle of the great apes in terms of neocortex and average group size. Being a good group member requires the capacity to understand complex and subtle social rules, recognize when actions might offend others, and control desires to engage in behaviors that might violate group norms. People favor their own groups. Banding together in a group provides numerous advantages, <clears throat> such as security from predators and assistance in hunting and gathering food. Over the course of human evolution, it was critical for groups to identify other groups as friends, other or suppliers, or foes as competitors. One such, once such a categorization was made, it was equally critical to react accordingly, either by working together or exhibiting aggression. Humans automatically and pervasively form groups. The formation of in-groups and out-groups. Two conditions appear to be critical for group formation. Reciprocity. If a person A helps or harms person B, then person B will help or harm person A. In other words, if you scratch my back, I will scratch yours. The other condition is transitivity. People generally share their friends' opinions of other people. If person A and person B are friends, then if person A likes person C and dislikes person D, then person B will also tend to like person C and dislike person D. In this photo from the 2014 World Cup, it is easy to tell the Brazilian supporters in yellow from the Chilean supporters in red. When it comes to soccer, groups are formed. The outgroup homogeneity effect is the tendency to view outgroup members as less varied than in-group members. A University of Missouri students may think University of Kansas students are all alike, but when they think about Missouri students, they cannot help but notice the wide diversity of student types. And that they think the students at their university are more varied as opposed to the students at the other university. Social identity theory. This is the idea that in-groups consist of individuals who perceive themselves to be members of the same social category and experience pride through their group membership. In-group favoritism. This is the tendency for people to evaluate favorably and privilege members of the in-group more than the members of the out-group. Minimal group paradigm, an experiment in which people were placed into one of two groups based on flipping a coin. They were given a task of dividing money to those in the experiment. They gave the money only to in-group members and not to out-group members. They knew membership was arbitrary and that giving to the out-group would not affect their own money for the in-group. Female friends tend to be more comfortable expressing affections for other. Brain activity associated with group membership. The middle region of the prefrontal cortex, called the medial prefrontal cortex, is especially important for thinking about other people, thinking about them generally or specifically, whether they are in in-groups or out-groups. 
Activity in this region is also associated with in-group bias that emerges after assignment through the minimal group paradigm. The medial prefrontal cortex is less active when people consider members of outgroups, at least members of extreme outgroups such as the homeless person, people or drug addicts. One explanation for this reduction in activity is that people dehumanize some outgroups. People more readily see human minds in in-groups than in outgroups. In developed nations, people tend to pass the homeless as if they were mere obstacles and they generally do not feel much sympathy regarding people's plight in developing nations. Groups influence individual behavior. Given the importance of groups, it is not surprising that people's thoughts, emotions, and actions are strongly influenced by their desire to be good group members. One way people try to fit in is by presenting themselves positively. Most people are easily influenced by others, conform to group norms, and obey commands made by authorities. Social facilitation. This is the idea that the presence of others generally enhances performance. A psychologist named Zajonk created a model that predicts that social facilitation can enhance or impair performance. If the dominant response is relatively easy, the presence of others will enhance that performance. If the dominant response is difficult, the presence of others will impair performance. According to this model, the mere presence of others leads to increased arousal. The arousal favors the dominant response, the response most likely to be performed in that situation. If the required response is easy or well-learned, performance is enhanced. If the required response is novel or not well-learned, performance suffers. De-individuation. In a classic study, the psychologists Zimbardo and Haney showed how quickly apparently normal students could be transformed into the social roles they were playing. The researchers had male undergraduates at Stanford University play the roles of prisoners and God's guards in a mock prison. Within days, some of the guards became brutal and sadistic. The prisoners became helpless to resist. This experiment was called off midway due to concerns for well-being. This also happened at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq during the Iraq War. Rape, use of dogs to incite fear, assault, humiliating positions to imply homosexuality, and forced to perform or simulate oral sex and masturbation occurred. The effect of groups in the Stanford Prison Study and at Abu Ghraib here are a couple of pictures as evidence of what I'm talking about. In the top one in the Stanford Prison Study, the student guards took on their roles with such vigor that the study was ended early because of concerns for the well-being of the guards and the prisoners. For example, ethics. And the picture on the bottom there is you know, some evidence of what was going on in the Abu Ghraib prison. The soldier guards at Abu Ghraib harassed, threatened, and tortured the prisoners. De-individuation is a state of reduced individuality, reduced self-awareness, and reduced attention to personal standards. This phenomenon may occur when people are part of a group. Self-awareness typically causes people to act in accordance with their values and beliefs. When self-awareness disappears, so do restraints. People are especially likely to become de-individuated when they are aroused and anonymous, and when responsibility is diffused. Here, de-individuated fans are doing the wave during a University of Oklahoma game against the University of Miami. Group decision making. The risky shift effect. Groups often make riskier decisions than individuals. Research has demonstrated that the initial attitudes of group members determine if the group becomes riskier or more cautious. Group polarization is the process by which initial attitudes of groups become more extreme over time. When a jury discusses a case, 
the decision tends to make individual jurors believe more strongly in their initial opinions about a defendant's guilt or innocence. Groupthink is the tendency of a group to make a bad decision as a result of preserving the group and maintaining its cohesiveness, especially likely when the group is under intense pressure, is facing external threats, and is biased in a particular direction. This describes an extreme form of group polarization. The group does not carefully possess all the information available to it, dissent is discouraged, and group members assure each other that they are doing the right thing. How to prevent groupthink. Leaders must refrain from expressing their opinions too strongly at the beginning of discussions. The group should be encouraged to consider alternative ideas, either by having someone play devil's advocate or by purposefully examining outside option, or opinions. Carefully going through alternatives and weighing the pros and cons of each can help people avoid groupthink. Social loafing. This is the tendency for people to work less hard in a group than when working alone. Six blindfolded people wearing headphones were told to shout as loudly as they could. Some were told that they were shouting alone. Others were told that they were shouting with other people. Participants did not shout as loudly when they believed that others were shouting with them. When people know that their individual efforts can be monitored, they do not engage in social loafing. <clears throat> People conform to and comply with others. Conformity. This is the altering of one's behaviors and opinions to match those of other people or to match other people's expectations. Why does this happen? There's a normative influence, and this is the tendency for people to conform in order to fit in with the group. And the informational influence. This is the tendency for people to conform when they assume that the behavior of others represents the correct way to respond. Social norms. These are the expected standards of conduct which influence behavior. Research consistently has demonstrated that people tend to conform to social norms. Adolescents conform to peer pressure to smoke, jury members to go along with the group rather than state their own opinions, and people stand in line to buy tickets for events. One social norm in industrialized societies is to stand facing the elevator door and facing away from other passengers. Violating this norm may make other passengers very uncomfortable. I can relate to that. I think it'd be very weird if somebody looked and just started staring at me without starting a conversation. Early conformity research. In the 1930s, a psychologist named Sharif became one of the first researchers to demonstrate the power of conformity and social judgment. Participants viewed a lit candle at the other end of a dark room. Small eye movements caused them to think the candle was moving. This is referred to as the autokinetic effect. Then participants had to do the same but with another person, participant next to them. This social aspect caused them to revise their estimates to be in line with the estimates of the other participant. Next we'll look at the ASH study. The hypothesis, conformity would not take place if there were objective perceptions. A naive participant joined a group of five other participants. The five others were confederates, secretly in league with the researcher. Each participant was asked to look at a reference line on the picture on the left and then say out loud which of the three comparison lines matched it in the little image on the right. On 12 of the 18 trials, the five confederates deliberately gave the wrong answer. The real participant in, in the middle on the bottom left picture, here's the answer given by the confederates. He has a hard time believing their wrong answers but he starts to go along with the group's obviously wrong answer. When the Confederates gave false answers first, three quarters of the real participants conformed by giving the wrong answer at least once. People tend to conform to social norms, even when those norms are obviously wrong. Factors affecting conformity. 
Research has consistently demonstrated that people tend to conform to social norms. When do people reject social norms? Group size. If small, then less conformity. If there are two or less people, but if there are three or more, then there is more conformity. They would reject social norms if there was a lack of unanimity or any dissent from majority. Groups enforce conformity, and those who fail to go along are rejected. Compliance. This is the tendency to agree to do things requested by others. Factors that increase compliance include being in a good mood, failure to pay attention, and failure to fully consider options. Compliance strategies include foot in the door. If people agree to a small request, they become more likely to comply with a large and undesirable request. Once people commit to the course of action, they behave in ways consistent with that commitment. Another strategy is called door in the face. People are more likely to agree to a small request after they have refused a large request. Another strategy is called lowballing. <clears throat> people who have already agreed to buy a product will often agree to pay the increased cost. The big decision was whether or not to make the purchase in the first place. A salesperson offers a product, for example, a car, for a very low price. Once the customer agrees, the salesperson may claim that the manager did not approve the price or that there will be additional charges. If these all sale, sound like salesman techniques, they are, and that's where those phrases come from. Foot in the door refers to door-to-door -door salesmen who used to go around sell various appliances to people. They had various tactics for getting you to agree to letting them in the door and getting their, their speech to give to you. And all these phrases come from that time period. Here's a graphic from the book to make that make a little bit more sense. An example of foot in the door, you agree to help a friend move a couch. Now you are more likely to comply when she asks you to help her move all of her belongings to her new apartment. For door in the face, a marketer calls and you refuse to answer a product questionnaire that takes 20 minutes. Now you are likely to answer five questions about the product instead of 20. For lowballing, you agree to buy a used car for $47.50. When the salesperson says he forgot to add some charges, you agree to buy the car for $52.75. Can social norms marketing reduce binge drinking? Studies have found that social norms marketing reduces the level of binge drinking on college campuses. Social norms marketing may inadvertently increase drinking among light drinkers, though whose behavior is also susceptible to social norms. This graph reports the results of using Facebook for social norms marketing at one college. The group that received intervention experienced a far greater decrease in drinking than the control group. People are obedient to authority. Obedience is when a person follows the orders of a person of authority. In one experiment by a psychologist named Milgram gave shocks to the participants. You might remember that I spoke about a couple of these studies in class, probably the third or fourth weekend. This is the one where they had the increasing shocks to the learners. Milgram's research demonstrated that ordinary people may do horrible things when ordered to do so by an authority. Individuals who are concerned about others' perceptions of them are more likely to be obedient. Obedience decreases with greater distance from the authority. A recent replication of this Milgram study found that 70% of the participants were obedient up to the maximum voltage in the experiment. Here's a picture of Stanley Milgram. He's pictured here with his infamous shock generator, demonstrated that average people will obey even hideous orders given by the authority figure. Over the 50 years since the Milgram studies were conducted, a number of criticisms have emerged. Some participants received stronger encouragement than others to continue. Some particip participants apparently did not fully believe that the victim was receiving life-threatening shocks. 
Some researchers have even questioned whether participants were truly obedient or whether they were following the experimenter's directives because they believed in the value of scientific enterprise and wanted to help the experimenter. Encouragements to continue for the sake of the experiment have greater impact on participants than telling them that they must obey because they have no choice. The most persistent critiques of Milgram's experiments revolved around the ethical treatment of the research participants. Despite the study's flaws, Milgram's results documented just how powerful situational influences can be. In this Milgram study, each participant, the teacher, was instructed to shock from another room the participant learner. Here the teacher helped strap the learner to an electric shock machine. The teacher was unaware that the learner was secretly in league with the experimenter. Psychiatrists, college sophomores, middle class adults, and both graduate students and professors in the behavioral sciences offered predictions about the result of Milgram's experiment. Their predictions were incorrect. The overall prediction was that fewer than one-tenth of a percent of participants in the Milgram experiments would obey completely and provide the maximum level of shock. In fact, 65% of participants were obedient at that shock level. Personal closeness reduced obedience in Milgram's experiment. In another condition, each teacher was instructed to touch and shock a learner sitting next to the teacher. As in the first condition, the shocks were portrayed as increasingly intense and painful. When teachers had to force the learner's hand on the shock plate, only 30% completely obeyed the experimenters and administered the maximum voltage. Affected by proximity to the learner, the one receiving the shocks. Debriefing in Milgram's experiment. After the experiment, each teacher was introduced to the Confederate learner and can see that the learner had not been harmed. However, not all of these debriefings happen quickly enough to be considered ethical today. When do people harm or help others? At points around the globe, we have seen terrorists, special forces, and militias killing civilians. We have also seen people being kind, compassionate, and giving in response to national, natural disasters. Members of the group Doctors Without Borders travel to dangerous regions to care for those in need. In the picture on the top, forces from the rebel group Seleka engage in military action in the Central African Republic in 2013. And in the bottom picture, the members of Doctors Without Borders treat the wounded during the Central African Republic coup. Many factors can influence aggression. Aggression is any behavior that involves the intention to harm another. Among humans, physical aggression is common among young children, but relatively rare in adults. Adults' aggressive acts more often include words or other symbols meant to threaten, intimidate, or emotionally harm others. Aggression can be considered across levels of analysis, from basic biology to cultural context. Another factor that influences aggression is heat. Studies will show that as temperatures rise during the summer, there are increased instances of crime and assault. Biological factors. Genetic research has identified the role of the MAOA gene in aggression. Indeed, it is often referred to in the media as the warrior gene. MAOA is not a violence gene, though. Instead, a particular form of the gene appears to make individuals susceptible to environmental risk factors associated with antisocial behaviors. Associated with the regulation of the amygdala and the neurotransmitter serotonin, being angry is associated with activity in a number of brain regions, which include the amygdala. Biological factors. The prefrontal cortex is important for controlling emotional and behavioral reactions. The hormone testosterone also appears to have a modest correlation with aggression. Testosterone changes may be the result rather than the cause of aggression, aggressive behavior, though. 
Testosterone remains high for the winners of competitive matches and drops lower for the losers. Social and cultural factors. Violence varies dramatically across cultures and even within cultures at different times. Over the course of 300 years, Sweden went from being a violent, being a violent to a nonviolent nation. This cultural change did not correspond with any change in the gene pool. Murder rates are far higher in some countries than in others. In the United States, physical violence is much more prevalent in the South than in the North. Culture of honor. This is the belief system in which men are primed to protect their reputations through physical aggression. Men in the southern United States, for example, traditionally were, and perhaps still are, raised to be ready to fight for their honor and to respond aggressively to personal threats. The, number, the numbers in this chart are the most recent available, from 2012. They come from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. The red hash mark up there is the average. This is the number of murders per 100,000 people per year. You can see that the United States falls under the average, but is far ahead of many of our industrial, industrialized nations that are our allies and friends. And then you can see where the nations up at the top fall on this. All of a sudden, my wish to vacation to Southern, South America is a little bit diminished. <laughs> These graphs show differences in behavior between men from the South and those from the North in studies at the University of Michigan. In the graph on the left, when insulted, men from the Southern U.S. had increased cortisol response. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It's released by the pituitary gland. Northern participants, after the insult, had lower levels of cortisol. When it's on the graph on the right, when insulted, men from the southern U.S. shook hands more vigorously than northern men. I guess that's a way to display strength or something without fighting. I don't quite get it. All right, and that concludes part one of the lecture for this week. Be sure to listen to part two.